For most people, Mexico isn't the first place to come to mind for an epic road trip. Sadly, it's gotten a bad rap from mainstream media. Do not travel alert against travel to Mexico. Because right now it is too dangerous. Prompting many RVers to stay north of the border in fear of crime and cartel activity. But most people have it all wrong. After spending roughly five and a half months driving central and southeastern Mexico in 2020, we realized how amazing this country truly is and what a paradise it can be for adventure-seeking RVers. We saw humpback whales! This is the coolest day of my life. As experienced RVers in Mexico, we knew this trip wouldn't be without challenges. I only got pulled over. Okay. This is awful. I've run up twice. Today has been the even worse drive day. But as you'll see, the surprises and the setbacks are more than worth it. Oh yeah, I could get used to this life. Can you believe we could say that we just like released baby turtles into the wild? That's why over the next three hours, we're taking you with us on our journey, driving over 5,000 miles through mainland Mexico in 2020 and 2021. You will notice masks in this video, which were required when we were visiting but I hope you can look beyond that and instead see the magic of Mexico. From its rich culture, incredible archeological zones, tasty food, unique beverages, and of course, stunning landscapes. Our goal in sharing this video is to help you discover the magic of Mexico so you can follow in our footsteps and RV Mexico too. If you want help along the way, make sure to grab our 70 page digital guide. This downloadable guide shares everything you need to know about van life or RVing mainland Mexico including how to prepare your vehicle, what to bring, crossing the border, safety, driving, camping spots, foods to try, and so much more. Plus, you'll have access to our personal travel map with over 200 pins of places to visit across this amazing country. You can grab your copy using the link in the description below. Now buckle up and hold on as we take you with us on the road trip of a lifetime, RVing mainland Mexico. A little bit confusing. We went yeah. to the Mariposa Bridge, which is where you're supposed to cross at, but the truck lane is closed, so it says there's only cars. Luckily, we're high enough clearance, but we're just not sure if this is where we're supposed to be. I think we're in Mexico. <laughs> That border crossing is crazy! Like literally nothing happened. Nothing happened. We went through a gnarly little toll booth that we almost crashed inside the RV in because the... Because of the topes. Because the topes were so awful. Very different than... The Colombia the border crossing. The Colombia Yeah, Colombia. Like we had to stop. They wanted to get in. I had to pull out all the tools. They had to send us through this giant x-ray machine. And then over here... You just crossed. See ya. Bye. which is two axles, is 113 pesos. Gracias. So the biggest lesson we learned last time from crossing the border was it is extremely important to have pesos on hand. So we are nice and prepared this time. We wasted so much time trying to figure out pesos, trying to figure out how to get gas. Like there was a giant learning curve that we're gonna try to get you over that hump quickly this, this time. time. Absolutely. No, no, it's abierto. Espera. So he's coming on board. <laughs> okay, gracias. gracias. He said the Ban Jercito is about 10 minutes up on the road on the right. Let's do it. But I can't believe we're in Mexico. That was scary easy, actually. High fives. Yeah. We're in Mexico. So now we go to the Ban Jercito, which is where we get our tourist visa validated, which is the FMM. And then we also get our TIP, which is our temporary import permit for our scooter. Most of the time, Google Maps does a decent job navigating, but I will tell you what, this border crossing to Ban Jercito was not good. Luckily, we saw the sign for it. We nearly crashed trying to get off and not miss it. It's a gnarly entrance, so it is... keep your eyes peeled and slow way the F down. Ugh. All right, guys. 
We officially have a six month tourist visa for Mexico. Our vehicle's registered. Have copies of your passport, your driver's license, both the front and back. And then copies of your vehicle registrations because they will want that. But if you don't have any of those copies, they do have a copy station here. It was 10 pesos for three copies, so no big deal if you don't have it. You're going to go to get your FMM approved first. I would definitely suggest getting your FMM paid for and completed online and just printing it out and bringing it. I accidentally missed the month on my birth date even though they ask you like a million times, is everything correct? And I checked and I checked and it wasn't. So I had to scratch that one even though I paid for it. They can't change it once you've submitted it. I had to apply for a new one where you just fill out a fill form. The paperwork, and then go pay for, for it, then come back and get it stamped. Mm -hmm. Dennis's was done in like five seconds. Yeah, so that would have shaved off probably 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But it only took us an hour. Yeah. Since we already have our tip for our RV, we didn't have to pay anything for that. The tip is good for 10 years, but we did have to pay for our scooter. So we paid 8,644 pesos and that will be refunded to us in full when we exit. We have right. to just turn in our tip. Right. And now they are digital. They print you a copy so that you have it on you. So if you ever get pulled over or something, but you also can just pull it up online. So they send it to your email. Mexico buys 360 pesos. We are directly on the beach. There's like mountains out in the distance over the ocean. We have full electricity, water, and dump. We're in heaven. And we pulled right in and didn't even need leveling blocks because the site, it's on level, but to our advantage. All we had to do was push the slide out and bingo, literally smack dab in the middle of the, of the level. And now, it's time to get in our bathing suits. I'm in mine. And go for a swim. About to leave. Already packing. Come with me. I'm not really asking. We'll get away to a place where we don't know. About to see the world in action. What we can be. Life with no distractions. We'll get away. This is what we waited for Take my hand, we'll make it somehow We can't miss out I'm done living life with the lights out Die with my own doubts Be free with me We made a friend. We're definitely back in Mexico. You can tell by the number of stray dogs, but they're all super friendly here and so cute. Yeah. But last night's dinner wasn't exactly spectacular. The place that was yeah. recommended to us, it's just a few buildings down, was actually closed by the time we got there, which was still rather early, but... So we went to a different restaurant and it was like not very good. Then we went to a second restaurant to try and redeem it. And that actually was great, but we were, you know, a little bit full, so we didn't really get to enjoy it that much. So this morning we're going to go back to the restaurant we tried to. It's called Brisa del Mar. It's just two buildings down from this RV park and they actually serve breakfast. Chilequillas, it has queso, huevos, and then we got huevos rancheros. This entire meal for the two of us cost seven dollars. Thank you, Mexico. Uh, and there's no body here. Well, Liz is 
paying for the full hookup site. I'm gonna get us mapping to the next destination. I think it's like a five hour drive, which I'm not really looking forward to, but what you gotta do? Down here in Mexico, you definitely need to plan stuff. You gotta call ahead, find out if your rig can fit, find out if they have all the amenities you're looking for, like hot water, electricity, dump. Sometimes you'll pull into these places and if you didn't ask the right questions before you got there, you might not get what you were originally expecting. Is voluntario? Voluntario. So something very interesting this go around than our last trip. All of the tolls we've gone through, every single one since we've crossed, has been voluntary. Meaning there are like independent groups in the area that will take over the toll booths and they pretty much shut them down. So whatever amount should be paid to the toll company isn't and instead you can voluntarily donate to uh, the toll booth operator style, the new ones. So the vigilantes. Yes, the vigilantes. The All of these um, stops are getting like nerve wracking. They've been yeah. banging on our RV and slowing us down, and they've stopped. Now they've got straight. This this one's straight up blocked out by cars. Yeah. So some of them are not optional. Not optional. Let's go. Okay. Money. Por. Okay. M money, para que? Para que? It was a very not pleasant experience. My stomach was like so... I mean, they're not like super intimidating, but at the same time, the, the experience overall is not... Fun. Not fun, that's for sure. Legit toll. First legit toll since we've been here. I'm not gonna lie, after that last experience, I've kind of welcomed it, but it is 328 pesos. So uh, much, much more expensive. Well, we made it to our next stop. We are in the middle of nowhere, but it's called Hotel El Mirador and it's on the beach. It's a beautiful spot. There's no fence blocking our beachfront view, which is great. The sun is setting. There's a restaurant we can go to, full service hookups again, but I have gotten our first bout of uh, Montezuma's revenge. Bound to happen. We knew this was, our stomachs have to get used to being back in Mexico and uh, 24 hours is all it took for me. I'm drinking some Slippery Elm. It helps soothe the stomach. It's not very pleasant to drink, but hey, neither is Pepto-Bismol. I'm not even sure I'm gonna eat dinner tonight. That's how bad I feel. But I think Dennis is gonna go grab some grub. Two hours later. This is awful. I've run up twice. I feel like we were doing so good. We were on such a high enjoying Mexico. And then today's drive day was tough. Now, I'm pretty sure I have food poisoning. All night without throwing up or having to go to the bathroom. It was a really bad, like, six hour bug, but I'm better. So I'm thankful. It was awful. Ah. <sighs> yeah, I want to say something. Hi, what's going on? Yeah? Wind gloves. You there? Oh, are you having a me 
Michelada? Yeah. Michelada time. How is it? It's very good. So I got a Michelada and I got Camarón Aguachiles. It's pretty good, but it's spicy, so you might want to stay away. I went some Coco Frio coconut water for those who don't know have a lot of uh, electrolytes. So rather than having to have a sugary fake electrolyte drink, you can just drink coconut water. After another non-eventful night, thank heavens, we headed off to our next destination, stopping at the local Soriana for our first grocery run. It was a big haul, guys, costing a whopping $9.15 for four nights worth of food. We are arriving just as the sun is setting and they were closing up the gate. Their phone number was not working. I tried calling to make a reservation, but they didn't answer. I called like four times. There's no backup option for their hour, which means we'd be driving at dark. Not good. That would have got very interesting very fast if we literally would have arrived 30 seconds later because he was pulling his van out of the driveway in front of the closed gate when we pulled up. <laughs> just in time. They have a palapa to sit and enjoy the view. Gorgeous. It's another beautiful day here in Mexico and there is no one on the beach. Not a single soul beside myself. Just pristine, gorgeous beach side. I have some work to do today. It's a Monday. Our video comes out shortly and I have work to do outside of that for real estate. But I didn't want to be inside the whole day. We have such beautiful views, no one's out here. I mean, it's begging to be enjoyed. So I decided to come take my computer, my chair, and work while listening to the waves crash. We worked for the remainder of the day, finishing the night off watching the sunset under our private palapa. It was glorious. We're about to leave our little slice of heaven here and beautiful Celestino... Gasca. Gasca, ooh, good memory. Pretty, pretty sure it's Gasca. Via Celeste is a little oasis. I mean, it is perfection. There is a pool here, several cabanas that you can actually like rent houses. They have decks and palapas all around for you to enjoy the beautiful views and sunsets. It's about a four hour drive, so I think we're gonna pack up here and hit the road. Let's do it. one paradise for another. It's never ending here in Mexico. You just keep delivering and delivering. We are on the beautiful lake Santa Maria de Oro and this is 220 pesos per night and normally this place would have a restaurant. I think they're closed right now because of COVID. There's just not enough people here to justify having the restaurant open but it is beautiful. You can go swimming right here in the lake. It's like a waterfall that you can visit which is like five minutes back up the road. We're just gonna enjoy the views now. Have a, a nice chill evening. That's right. We'll see you tomorrow.
graceful. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's what I do. Good morning. Oh, yeah, this feels awesome. I love how clear it is. It reminds me of the springs. Like, that's how clear it is. We were planning to just be here for a night, but it's too amazing to just leave this paradise so quickly. So we're gonna have like a tranquilo day, hopping in and out of the water. If we're feeling up to it, we might go see the waterfall that's up the mountain. I don't know, that might be a little more effort than we are willing to uh, exert right now. I'm gonna try to do as little work as possible. Like normal? Like normal. I am gonna make time today to at least study Spanish. There's nothing else that I do. One of the things I love so much about RVing in Mexico is the opportunity to speak with locals and practice my Spanish. Dennis and I have been trying to become fluent in Spanish, or at least just improve our speaking skills for the last year or two, ever since our first trip to Mexico. We just recently found a new program called Lingoda, which has really helped us like take it to the next level. De tiempo que aún no terminaron. Ustedes han vivido en este casa siempre? Today's class was on the present perfect, which is one of the past tense in Spanish. The past tense has always been really tricky for me. Today was really good because I got some corrections on things I was saying wrong. Hoy he visto gallinas en un huerto. Ah, huerto. Huerto, huerto. And I also now understand when to use certain tenses. In el caso de esta or este, este, puedes repetir posible en inglés porque pienso que no entiendo. Whenever we say este o esta, it's like we're putting ourselves in the middle of that period of time. Learning a new language is intimidating, and I've always struggled with consistency and follow through. What I've really found to help is reviewing the new words that I've learned and actually practicing speaking every single day. And I'm so grateful for Lingoda because it gives me the structure that I need in my lessons. I took a test online to find out where I was at, and it gives me a course that I can move through to learn new vocabulary, learn new grammar. Lingoda is hands down the best way to go from learning just a few words and having trouble truly communicating to being able to speak with confidence and to be able to get around as you're doing daily things, which is so important if you're traveling to Mexico. You can take one-on-one -on -one classes if you're not comfortable talking in a group setting yet, or you can hop on a group class like I just did. If you really want to accelerate your learning though, I highly recommend you push yourself and do their 60-day sprint. It's a no-brainer to me because if you complete your lessons on time in that two-month period, you get 50% of your tuition back, or you can get 100% back in class credits to prepare for your upcoming trip to Mexico or any Spanish-speaking country in the future, make sure to try Lingoda using the link in the video description below. Don't forget to sign up for the sprint and end soon and use the code ESRV to get $25 off. Yeah, mucho, mucho. The next day we packed up our RV and made our way through the state of Jalisco. This region is known for tequila. It's where the famous Mexican spirit comes from and is also home to the town of tequila. Since we are on a tight timeline to experience Dia de los Muertos further south, we didn't have time to stop here on this trip. We continued onward toward Guadalajara, Mexico's second largest city, and honestly, a complete madhouse to drive an RV in. But we made it after a very stressful four hour drive and our first outing was to grab something to eat. So I'm getting something that comes from Sonora, which is the state that we drove through as soon as we crossed over the border from Arizona, and it's called Bacanora, which it still comes from agave, but like mezcal, since it doesn't come from tequila, they can't call it tequila. Everything we ate that night was incredible. From the homemade sourdough bread, crab toast, empanadas with heirloom corn, the flavors were fresh and balanced. And seriously, so, so good. Poblano risotto. What? Our first stop today is to try a specialty here called birria, 
which is like a goat stew. So they take the goat, they put it with a lot of different chilies and spices, they cover all of it and they put it in a pot or over the grill and then they bake it, typically with an agave leaf. It's supposed to create this really incredible stew and all of the juices from the goat just end up in the pot. We found out about Tacos Pidias on Taco Chronicles, which if you haven't watched that show. Es porque es perfecto. ¿Quién no quiere un taco? You're welcome. It's on Netflix and it's amazing. This is one of the most recommended places in town. I definitely think it takes the more touristy side. We're gonna give this one a try. So this is it, this is Birria. So it's roasted goat in a consomme of its own juices, so like all the fat that condenses down into the pot while they're, uh, while they're stewing it. Yeah, fresh tortilla, like almost too hot to handle. Oh yeah, meat's super soft and tender. The spices aren't super overwhelming, like it's not like a super spicy taco. Since we only have today to explore Guadalajara, we are just staying in the historic center right now. It's really beautiful. There's lots of pretty churches. There's some cool historical plazas and statues, but we are honestly overwhelmed by how huge this city is. There is so much traffic. There's a lot of city noise. There's just like a lot of things going on. We are really enjoying its craft beer scene. It does have an awesome nightlife. We went out to an amazing bar the other night. And it has just like a really rich culture with a lot of proud mariachi traditions. So I definitely hope to come back in the future because this is a really cool city. So now we have about a three and a half hour drive to Pratscuero, which is going to be where we are going to celebrate and get to experience Dia de Muertos. In the town of Pascuaro, there's a dock where you can hop on a boat and then travel to an island in the middle of the lake that is actually where they believe the tradition of Dia de Muertos started, which is called Hanitio Island. Hanitio is probably one of the top destinations that you want to visit, but there are three other islands in Lake Pátzcuaro that you can come to, and Pátzcuaro itself is a really famous place to enjoy Dia de Muertos. We've seen Coco, the Disney movie based on the Dia de Muertos holiday. Mama Coco lives here in Michoacan. So this is going to be a very different year than usual. There's normally huge festivities. There's boats going 24 hours to and from the islands. People are partying until all hours of the night. There's lots of drinking, eating, and music. We're going to go into town and try and see the square all decorated there. And there is one Pantheon that's about 15 minutes from where we're staying in our RV park that is open. After filling up on some food, we drove to the nearest Pantheon, or cemetery, to witness the beautiful decorations or alteras made on each gravesite to celebrate the afterlife of the loved one and reconnect with them here on the physical plane. Today is day two at Dia de Muertos and it might be hard to hear me because we came to a new town that has very lively celebrations. We came to Saint Sansun, which is about a 20 minute drive from Pátzcuaro. 
and is another really wonderful place to experience Dia de Muertos. And their Panteón is beautiful. So day two is for adults, and we're going to show you a little bit around this gorgeous Panteón. The tradition of Dia de los Muertos dates back to pre-Hispanic times. Celebrated on the 31st of October through the 2nd of November, Dia de los Muertos today has a mix of both indigenous and Spanish influences. Altera designs of all shapes and sizes are handcrafted for each grave to place offerings or ofrendas, gifts to enrich the afterlife and welcome loved ones back. It's traditional to decorate an altar with the deceased's favorite food and drink, toys or pictures in addition to candles and flowers. The candles are meant to help light the way back for the dead, and each flower used on the ofrendas carries a special meaning. Marigolds, which have a bright yellow or orange color, are the most popular flower used to decorate the altaras, and their sweet fragrance is believed to attract the souls to the altar. The red hue of the coxcomb is supposed to represent the blood of Christ, while the white of the chrysanthemums or baby's breath symbolizes peace, beauty, and sympathy. Dia de Muertos isn't viewed as a sad holiday. It's a sacred celebration when families gather together and connect with those that have passed on. We saw families throughout the Pantheon relaxing and chatting by the graves, dancing, drinking, and listening to music. I felt very humbled to be able to witness this powerful and important holiday that carries such deep cultural importance for the Mexican people. One thing we've been looking forward to trying since we went to Ambulante is the pan de muerto. Which is the day of the dead bread. It's a special bread that they only make during the season. Typically bakeries will use a special type of flour and, and recipe for their bread. It's like a sweet bread made with a little bit of orange or anise. Since Dide Muertos really dates back all the way to the Aztec time, they used to do sacrifices to their deity of death around this time every year. And when the Spanish arrived, they said no, no for human sacrifices. So they started sacrificing bread. So this is supposed to be uh, technically in the shape of a skull and then the, the things on top are supposed to represent a bone. Mm. Let me get mm. So many of the locals said that people advertise Dia de Muertos being November 1st and 2nd, but in Mexico here, they actually celebrate on the 31st and the 1st. So we went out on one of the correct days and kind of missed a big day of the commencing of the celebrations. Pátzcuaro is a great place to kind of like find a hotel or stay, but I definitely suggest visiting the towns outside of here. All of the small villages that are next to the Lake Pátzcuaro are known for having the really traditional practices. Since Hanitio Island was closed for us during Dia de Muertos in 2021, we are going to be venturing to the island today to see what Hanitio is all about. It was only about a 25 minute boat ride, which cost 100 pesos per person. And it was a really relaxing little like treat to yeah. slowly come up to the island with the statue. Uh -huh. This is a Pueblo Magico, and I can see On why. On its own, right? Yes. The island is a Pueblo Magico. And it's beautiful. I mean, there's like all these bright colors, lots of artisanal shops where you can buy souvenirs, things like that. Mm -hmm. They have micheladas and cervezas and shots oh, all over the plenty place. Plenty of that. <laughs> So you can uh, browse and have a little drink while you're at it. Uh -huh. But right now we are walking up to the statue that's at the top of the island because you can actually go inside up a spiral staircase to the very tippy tippy top.
We made it to the top. It's like right where her sleeve ends oh. for, her, for her hand. It's pretty but impressive. It's still really cool. Definitely a fun activity to do. There's only 10 paces to get in, so. Oh, totally worth it. Yeah. yeah. I think we're gonna hop back on the ferry, head back home before it gets too cold, which by the way, if you plan to come here in October, be prepared for beautiful days. Like, I mean, 70 degrees sunny with a slight breeze, but at night it gets really cold, like lows in the 40s to upper 30s. So be prepared for chilly weather. For sure. Ollie the Adventure Cat. Da, 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 da. The campsite that we are at is beautiful and so peaceful. It's a hotel and RV park that's in the pretty close to the city center of Potsquoto. Um, they have like weekly rates and nightly rates. There's typically a pool that's open. The Wi-Fi has been great. Mm -hmm. Uh, water dump, electricity at every spot, and it's just a really nice place to to explore this area. We've ended up meeting tent campers that are biking all the way through the United States, and then they flew down to Mexico, and now they are biking through Mexico before going back to Europe. They're from the UK and Spain. See you Bye. in Spain. Adios. 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 So after we picked up our laundry today in Pascuaro, we decided to hop on the scooter and head back into Sin Sun San because we didn't get to explore that much the first time we were here. We tried to go to the archaeological zone, but it's closed because of COVID. If you are coming in the future, we definitely suggest trying to go to the archaeological zone. It's supposed to be a really unique one because of the shape and the formations of the pyramids. Instead, we decided to walk across the street. There's a coven. It's literally down the street, like a block away from the pyramid. There's a church and an ex-convent. So this was actually built and monks lived here about 400 to 500 years ago when the, just after the Spanish arrived. This was originally the capital for Michoacan for the Purepecha people. Just like all of the other churches and convents that we've seen in Mexico, they have torn down quite a few of the pyramids uh, from the ancient peoples to construct the churches and the convents. This is a very typical thing because when the Spaniards came over, they were trying to convert all of the natives to Catholicism. So really beautiful grounds, mm -hmm. for sure. There's olive trees that they planted when they first arrived that are like 400 to 500 years old that are yeah. massive. So those Shiny. are really cool. Yeah. So I think we're just gonna walk around a little, maybe browse some of the artisan shops, and then we're gonna go back over to Pátzcuaro since there's not, a, not too much we can explore so over here. Wrong, yeah. We decided to finish our time in Pátzcuaro by hopping on a colectivo and treating ourselves to a meal at one of Pátzcuaro's best restaurants, Santo Huacol. Our five course tasting menu was just 380 pesos and was seriously so delicious. Today's drive is a short one, just under an hour to the city of Morelia. Unfortunately, this is another overnight stay for us. We have less than 24 hours here, but we are going to explore as much as we can, starting at Mercado de Dulces y Artesanías. They're known for their regional sweets made from dried fruits and caramelized milk. You just couldn't wait, could you? That's so good. That's really good, right? Our next stop was the Zocalo, Morelia's center square. It seemed every street had beautiful colonial architecture or churches with busy locals all around. We continued on until we saw a churro shop that was serving freshly made cinnamon coated churros. Uh, yes please! <laughs> Hello, Hello. We finished our quick city tour greedily munching churros and admiring the mile-long aqueduct built by the Spanish in the 1700s that cuts directly through the city center. After stocking up on pet supplies and groceries, we made our way to our next destination, Malinalco, Mexico. Yeah. 
Our camping spot here is beautiful. It's very expensive. I think it's because they were typically closed down. They just kind of were being friendly and allowed us to stay since we didn't really have another spot here in town. But it's gorgeous. It's 400 pesos for the two of us. So 200 pesos per person is dry camping, but they do have showers and a gorgeous pool. But coming in here, there was a bunch of low hanging branches and we ended up totally bending our Cell booster, Cell antenna. booster antenna. The roads were so rough yesterday. We had our egg carton fall and crack four of the brand new eggs we just got. Luckily it was only four. And then everything in our bathroom cabinets, both the top and bottom fell out and was all over yeah. the bathroom. Not to mention yesterday's drive was the most expensive for all the toll roads. Mm -hmm. All of these are officially being manned, you know, as as they should be on the toll roads right. and we spent an astronomical amount just on tolls you don't want to lead you to believe that traveling mexico is this you know perfect, waterfalls wonderful. and rainbows because it takes work it's it's definitely stressful at times but like rv travel the stress usually rewards you with something amazing to see once you get to your destination and kind of relax so we're really hoping Malinalco does that for us. And we're ready to show you what this Pueblo Mexico is known for. Being just a two hour drive from Mexico City, Malinalco is a popular weekend getaway for people to relax in nature. It's a really small town with lots of charming art and beautiful outdoor markets, but it's most popular for Conchinchan Archaeological Zone, which is where the elite jaguar and eagle warriors in the Aztec Empire would have trained thousands of years ago. Unfortunately, because we were visiting during the pandemic, the site was closed. It's also closed on Mondays if you plan to visit here. The Cecina tacos totally turned my day around. Thinly sliced beef, grilled onions with a spicy avocado sauce and some pickled onions with some lime and french fries. So good, like total gluttonous delight, but delicious. And I'm so excited. We ended up getting some fresas, strawberries and some nopales which are the prickly pear cactus from the market. It costs us 40 pesos. And I asked, they're not necessarily organic, but they don't use pesticides. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> At least that's what she told me. Uh, yeah, whatever, that's what we're gonna believe. Yeah, this market they use every single day. They have food vendors. They actually have people selling fresh fruits and vegetables, flowers, there's also clothes, pretty much anything you could want, which mm -hmm. was a really nice little way to kind of see the town. Apparently this place gets really popping Thursday through Sunday. So if you're coming here, I highly suggest coming on a weekend. I think you're gonna have a lot more options for what's open. Right now I'd say about 25% of the restaurants and stores are actually open. Right. You can also take a guided hike, I just found out, up into some of the mountains that are surrounding this area. And you can find petroglyphs, so where they actually have like paintings really? and carvings in the rock. But you have to go with a guided tour. But now now we're going to walk to a monastery that of course was built shortly after they came and found the pyramids but it does have very beautiful murals inside. This monastery was beautiful, definitely worth a quick pop in. It's currently under restoration, but you can still see all of the beautiful tapestries. It blew my mind because when we were in Teotihuacan, the night laser show on the side of the pyramids depicted what the frescoes on the outside of the pyramid would have looked like. It wouldn't have just been bare stone. It would have covered it with this really smooth white stucco and then painted really colorful frescoes all over the outside of the painting. Well, that's exactly what it felt like inside of here. So I felt like we just got a glimpse, even though it was in a Catholic monastery, to pre-colonial Mexico. Like, that was really cool.
Oh my god. Since most places in Malinalco were still shut down, we decided to head out a day early and drive three hours to our next destination, Tepetzlan. The drive to Tepetzlan was absolutely spectacular. We wove in and out of fields of flowers, rural farms, small pueblos, and eventually climbing over a massive mountain pass. We passed several volcanoes and even a national park, Parque Cumbres de la Jusco. The drive felt more like Northern California than anything we'd expect in Mexico. It was beautiful. As we approached the hotel where we'd be staying for the next few nights, we were greeted with extremely narrow, windy roads, way too many topes, and a few pretty much unpassable roads. It was tough, but we made it. Starting the morning off with a hike is always a great start to the day. We're picking you up from Tepetzlan. We made it to our next destination, which is a hotel in the Pueblo just outside of the city called San Juan. And our gracious host invited us to hike up to the mountain because there's um, like national ecological protected parks all around. Tons of trees all over these beautiful like crags just jutting out of the ground around the towns. It's quite impressive. They have a pretty famous pyramid or ruins that are here that unfortunately we won't be able to take you to this time, but there's still a lot of fun stuff to experience here. The hike this morning was wonderful. We're now enjoying a little bit of tea outside because today we're gonna to be doing something very special, which is like the whole reason we actually came to this specific location and destination. It's not easy to get here. <laughs> very narrow roads in a small, small mountainous town. But we came to Tema's Cal Tepetzlan, which is a hotel here that specializes in doing a very special ceremony called Tema's Cow. Tema's Cow is very similar to a Native American uh, ceremony called the Anipi, depending on the tribe, or as most folks know it, the Sweat Lodge. Uh, and this is a cleansing ceremony uh, where you go in and it's very hot inside. Like There's usually very a hot. bed of hot coals. <laughs> and the ceremony master um, says some prayers, sings some songs, and throws water on the stones to create an even more humid and very hot, hot environment. Um, but it basically, as long as you do your own work correctly, then you can cleanse yourself of a lot of negative uh, energies or basically anything that's bothering you. And this hotel does it in a really unique way. Their Tamez Cal room is actually a mushroom. <laughs> Tamez Cal can look different for every place that's holding it, but really it just looks like a clay room that has one right. opening that you walk inside and you're kind of sitting in a circular motion. Right. So they made theirs into a mushroom cap, which is pretty cool that you actually get to sit inside at the top of the mushroom uh, for the Tamez Cal ceremony. It's a very unique experience, like all around. The grounds here are super cool. They've put a lot of thought and effort into bringing different spiritual aspects from all sorts of different cultures into the entire hotel. So we've parked our RV here for several days so that we can both explore Tepetzlan and of course enjoy the ceremony we're going to be doing later today. But they also have rooms if you decide you want to be in, in Mexico City and maybe do a day trip out here to experience that. If we were going to do this again, I would probably park in Mexico City and make this a day trip for sure. Because you're going to be pretty stressed out like I was after you get here and you're in anything bigger than say like a converted sprinter van like if you're in a if you're in a van conversion okay sure 
But if you're in a full-fledged RV like we are, uh, I would shy away from that. But the Temescal experience was intense. Rogerio was an incredible guide, and we definitely suggest taking the opportunity to experience this unique cultural practice if you're coming to Mexico. Buenos dias! We decided to come into the city center. It is a Saturday, and I will tell you what, this city is popping. There are people everywhere. There's like a huge mercado all down the streets, and they are selling absolutely everything you could everything. ever imagine. Housewares, artisanal goods, paintings, kids, kids, toys, kids toys, cookware. Oh, I mean, man. it's insane. It's so much to see. of stalls, anything you could think of, but they also have an area dedicated just to food. It's massive. There's fresh food that you can buy, and there's also a ton of food stalls. This one is a vegetarian vegan. They also have meat options, but it accommodates vegetarians or vegans, which is really nice. So we just got a specialty from the region called Tlate Quilladas. Tlate Quilladas. But it's pretty much a, like a, a patty. It's made with a bunch of different seeds, amaranth, corn, chia seeds, and then they mix it with different flavors. So Dennis got one that has mezcal and chapulines, which is grasshoppers, and then I got one made with squash blossoms. Walk past this little corner that was popping. Decided to check it out. It turns out it's like the uh, Havana corner in this little town. And they're making badass uh, frappe frozen drinks. I got the mezcal margarita with the chili rim. God dang. And I got the strawberry, blackberry, mint mojito with Bacardi. Ooh, 160 pesos for two of these huge drinks. I feel like we have made it to the party side of Tepatlan. This city is definitely like a tourist town. Because it's so close to Mexico City, so many residents come here. So most of the tourists that are here are Mexican. It is like you come here to party and enjoy and there's just so many shops to see. An inevitable stop when you're RVing to the south of Mexico is the city of Cholula, Puebla. We've stayed here twice before on our first trip and absolutely love this city. This trip we didn't do too much exploring, but instead some much needed errands. Dennis made some pretty big changes and we met back up with our friends Ruth and Rob who will be traveling with us to Oaxaca. As we prepared to head out of town, we noticed someone with the iconic blue basket selling tacos de canasta, which is a special taco from this region that we had to stop and get. I'm actually really surprised at how good these tacos de canasta are. Like I kind of figured since they were usually made the day before or really early in the morning, they're cold, they're drowned in grease, it wouldn't be really that great, but these are actually really good. <laughs> This feels like a breakfast item. Mm -hmm. Glad we did this early. Mmm, the papa's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. After scarfing down some delicious tacos, we began the five-hour journey toward Oaxaca City. This ride was one of the most unique and jaw-dropping drives we've made in all of Mexico, taking us over several mountain passes and through a sea of stovepipe cactus. It was epic. made it to Market Lane Merced. We're about to enjoy some of those. I ended up with the chorizo, which comes with chorizo, queso, and beans. So they throw all that on top of a grilled tortilla and then smother it in asiento, which is apparently some sort of animal lard or fat, which I'm sure is going to be absolutely delicious. It's hot. That was really good. Yeah. <laughs> 
Mamela's were a very good start to the day, but we are still very hungry. So today we're just going to be going to a bunch of different markets and trying all different meals. We just got an order of tlayudas, which is the most typical street food that you can get here. It's normally served at night, but luckily we found a place that's open now. They are massive. Of course, it starts with tortillas. So it's like a huge tortilla, like the size of a pizza. And then they put more of the asiento on it. Then they put beans, cheese, and then they kind of like fold it over. Sometimes there's lettuces, avocado. Ours has queso de Oaxaca or quesilla on it. This is half. <laughs> they cut it up for us to share. Mm. It's really crunchy. Now we're gonna get nervous, which is ice cream. They have a special type of ice cream here. Mm. I don't know. It's like it almost tastes like watermelon a little, or raspberry. I don't even know how to describe it. But it's less of like ice cream and more of a mix between sorbet and ice cream. So it definitely has like the icy vibe to it. I'm good. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos a la clase. So we are here at Casa Crespo. We are taking a cooking class. Oscar guided us through several pre-Hispanic ingredients that would have been traditionally cooked and eaten throughout Mexico, many of which are still used today, like dried chiles, medicinal herbs, cactus, garlic, and corn. But he introduced us to some unique ingredients too, including chicatanas, a flying ant from the Oaxaca region that only appears once a year. Oscar taught us how to grind the chicatanas into a paste so we could add it to a mole with jitomate, which are red tomatoes, dried chilies, and other spices. Honestly, everything we cooked was way out of our comfort zone, which was a great thing. We got to explore new flavors, try new cooking techniques, and cook with ingredients we would have never tried if we didn't have his guidance. One of our favorite dishes from the entire night was stone soup, which is traditionally made using water from the river with rehydrated chilies, garlic, and whole shrimp, blended together, then cooked with pot stones just before serving. We really enjoyed learning about the nixtamalization process of corn, which has been used throughout Mesoamerica for over 3,500 years to naturally remove the corn hulls, unlocking more nutrition and making it easier to digest. We used different heirloom corn varieties indigenous to Mexico to make three types of tortillas. One mixed with cotija cheese and squash blossom, one with the ojo santa leaf, which is a traditional Mexican herb, and a ceremonial tortilla that originates from Guanajuato. Hey. Oh. I'm making an elixir that's supposed to cure hangovers. Well, they use both names, poleo or yerba de borracha. Yeah. So this is the tea we just made, right? This is probably gonna be the best meal we've had in Mexico. I would throw that out there. Mm. Yeah. Oh, this is good. <laughs> Dinner was absolutely incredible. This was such a fun and unique experience. Thank you so much for having us. Right next door to 20 de Noviembre market is Benito Juarez. Whoa. Gracias. So one of the famous drinks you have to try when you come to Oaxaca is tejate. It's made from the mamey fruit, 
fermented corn and then they has cacao and it has this like foam on top and it's from the way that they churn from the fermentation process. It's supposed to be really like thick and hearty. It's normally a breakfast drink but you'll only typically see women serving this and Bonito Juarez Market's a good place to try it. Oh, it smells good. Oh, it's delicious. It kind of tastes like um, like caramel a little. It's not what I was expecting. Are you supposed to eat the top? The top I don't know. It's a little... <laughs> you are? I don't want to put it on, but it does look a bit like someone's throwing off the glass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait to finish this now. It smells good. Oh, yeah. It does. It smells like chocolate caramel. You put a little coffee in this and yeah, Starbucks. Well, that was a fun market. There's something there for everyone. Buenos dias! It's another beautiful day here in Oaxaca and today is an extra special day because we are going on a Mezcal tour with Mezcal Educational Tours. We're going to learn all about the process which is actually way more complex than I originally thought it was about making Mezcal. Unlike tequila, Mexico's famous spirit that is only made from the blue agave plant in the state of Jalisco, Mezcal is made from a number of different agave varietals throughout nine different states giving each batch of mezcal truly unique flavor characteristics provided by the species of agave, distillation process, and skill of the pelencaro producing it. Mezcal is mostly produced by small batch pelencaros and is always 100% pure agave, a step above tequila, which can be mixed with other grain spirits down to just 51%. Mezcal has deep ties in the Oaxaca region. The areas just outside of Oaxaca City are home to hundreds of different small batch palenques, like the ones we visited on our tour today. Our first stop was Palenque La Descendencia, where we learned how Felix makes mezcal from our tour guide Alvin. Mi nombre es Félix Ángeles Arianes. Vivo aquí en Santa Catarina, Minas. Soy el dueño del Palenque La Descendencia y los invito a degustar un sabroso mezcal. Pues tengo seis hijos hombres que trabajan conmigo y tres niñas. Traditional way of making mezcal is to cook the piñas in a in an oven in the ground. And this is an oven that's not baking right now, but this was being used up until about 4 days ago to bake 7 or 8 tons of agave. It's a conical shaped pit that goes down 6 or 8 feet below where I'm standing. Okay? So you've got an empty pit. You put logs in the bottom of the pit and then you slowly build a mound of rocks on top of the logs. Once the rocks are really, really hot and there's no flames shooting up, you're ready to bake your agave. Everybody makes a mezcal a little bit differently. They don't read books in almost all cases. You learn from your father and your uncle and your grandfather, but one stage of production that almost everybody uses, if you put the green agave on top of the hot rocks, it's gonna burn, okay? So what most people will do is they put a layer of wet, discarded fiber from the distillation process. It's called bagasso. So this used to be agave. They put a layer of wet fiber on top of the rocks, and then the piñas get put down around there and on top of the bagasso. Some people will put another layer of fiber on top of the piñas, and some people won't. Almost everybody will cover up their piñas with tarps, and then the dirt around here gets shoveled on top of the dirt and you keep on the shoveling the dirt on until there's no smoke escaping okay because you want it to be an airtight chamber and you're going to leave it like that for about five days then after about five days depending on how many tons and the species of agave you shovel off the dirt you take off the tarp and what used to be green piñas are now brown and sweet you've caramelized the piñas converted the carbohydrates to sugars there are three ways of crushing. You can crush it by hand, you can crush it with the horse or the mule or the team of oxen pulling the big wheel around called a tahona, 
or you can crush it using machinery. Whichever way you crush it, you first have to chop the agave up into little pieces. They'll either use a machete or an axe, or sometimes you can, you, can, you can break it into little pieces by hand. Some people add water as soon as this is crushed. Most people wait a couple of days until this heats up, depending on the ambient temperature. After he adds water, he's gonna stir it up with this, and it's gonna bubble. And the bubbling is the environmental yeasts interacting with the sweet baked crushed agave that's had water added, and that's the fermentation process. So a cap forms, it turns dark brown, the bubbling subsides, and everything shrinks. Felix makes mezcal differently than many pelenqueros. Instead of using copper distillation, he uses clay pots, a method of making mezcal that was taught to him by his father and grandfather. With this kind of distillation, you need a continuous flow of cold water coming in through there and going out through there. So what's happening right now is the steam is rising, the steam hits the bottom of the condenser and the drops of liquid fall onto the spoon and mezcal drips out over there. After the first distillation, the mezcal doesn't have the complexity or the alcohol content of good mezcal, so it's gonna be distilled a second time. And you're gonna pitch out the fiber because you've gotta clean out that pot. After everything's been distilled once, you put the single distillate back in the pot and you start the process all over again. So it's the skill of the maker rather than scientific equipment that is gonna determine the quality of the mezcal. So this is the second distillation. Whoa. Espadine is arguably the most popular and commonly produced mezcal. And it's a great place to start for those looking to begin a journey into the wide world of mezcal. But there are several others you'll find on a mezcaleria's menu like quiche, Tobala and Pechuga, a celebratory mezcal which adds chicken or turkey breasts with fruits like apples and guava plus spices like anise and cinnamon to the second distillation, producing a deliciously complex flavor profile. The traditional way of telling alcohol content by looking at the pearless or the bubbles the longer the bubbles last, the more uniform the size, and the more they clump it together, the higher the alcohol content. If the alcohol content is below about 40 and above about 60, the bubbles dissipate immediately. So he can tell the alcohol content within about one or two points. I'm not a big uh, mezcal, really I'm not a big liquor drinker. I'm just gonna preface this. Good though. Just to let y'all know, it is before 12 o'clock. <laughs> this is a, a recipe I, I developed a turkey breast pechuga distilled in copper with uh, Canadian maple syrup and bacon. And it's over 60% alcohol. So give me your cups and we'll sample a little bit. There we go. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> so remember, it's strong. Yep. But okay. it's good. That's good. Okay. Is that a rinse? <laughs> Mouthwash. Our next stop was Ramba Mezcal, a new palenque that was founded and operated by a woman, a rarity in the world of Mezcal. Unlike Felix and other palenques we toured today, Rosario Angeles is a first generation Mezcal maker who learned the art of making Mezcal on her own. Vivo en una comunidad que hace mezcal, entonces siempre he estado dentro del ambiente del mezcal y en verdad amo el proceso de, de hacer mezcal, se me hace toda una arte. Lo hago por amor. La primera generación de mi familia, entonces nadie me puso aquí, fue mi decisión y es gusto, placer. Rambá es la diosa del placer y es el placer de hacer mezcal. She wasn't roasting or distilling during our visit, but she let us try a few different types of roasted agave plants, including tobala and espadine, which would begin distilling tomorrow after 10 days of rest outside. Like Vegetarian beef, jer beef jerky. Oh, yeah. Salud. Many people think of mezcal as having a strong, smoky aroma or flavor from the way the agave is cooked. 
but every mezcal has its own flavor profile, and we were surprised by how many had no smoky notes at all. Quish. ¿Cómo lo pronuncias? Quish. 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 The final stop on the Mezcal tour was a copper distillation palenque. Alvin explained the difference in distillation processes and as always, we tried a lineup of their different Mezcals to see how copper distillation flavors differ greatly from clay. This is what's in the stills now. Oh actually, it's quite nice. Very soft. Very soft, it's warm and it has a lot more fruity notes to it. Oh, I actually like this a lot more I think than second distillation. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> After a lot of mezcal tasting, three different palenques, we're finally grabbing some lunch, which I think is very needed because Dennis might be feeling it. And by might, Dennis is feeling it. What happened? Wait a minute, well, I, I, need to, I need to defend myself, which is probably not making the best case. But yes, I have had a lot of mezcal and I am enjoying myself to the fullest. Okay, let's eat. Sakalula? Yeah. Dessert? Oh my gosh. So you, you're gonna eat These are huge! Each have a half a bun. Oh boy. Oh wow. Oh boy. Wow. So there's chocolate pieces inside, yeah? Yeah. There should be. Bye. 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 Thanks for everything, guys. Bye. Goodbye, guys. Bye. Today is our last day here in Wakaka, so we are making the most of it. We came to a pyramid that is open. Yay. So we hopped on a Collectivo, which cost us a whopping 18 pesos for the two of us. It took us into the center of town where we got a bus to Monte Alban, and we are going to be exploring this beautiful pyramid Monte Alban archaeological site, as it's known today, was once the capital for the Zapotec or Cloud Peoples, who inhabited this area for over 13 centuries, from 500 BC to 800 AD. A series of great plazas, temples, pyramids, and Tlachli courts, a popular ball game, are perfectly positioned between several valleys with breathtaking views of the mountains and the surrounding area all around. As beautiful as the views are from above, below the ancient city is a series of intricate passageways and nearly 170 tombs. The Zapotec were a very sophisticated society that was closely in tune with the sky. Their deep understanding of astrology guided the evolution of their civilization. They developed tools that revealed the time of day or approaching seasons using only the sun and had their own 260 day calendar system. There were many glyphs throughout the ruins that illustrated life during their rise to power as a dominating civilization in the area. A wall on the astrology pyramid is covered with images of warriors with upside down heads, each representing a conquest that was made. After the Spanish conquest in the 15th century, the Mixtec inhabited this site, and certain glyphs found here give evidence that the Olmec and other pre-Hispanic cultures inhabited or influenced the area at one point in time. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I don't know which way to go. This is so amazing. Oh, what did you do today on your Tuesday? Just visited some ancient pyramids, Mexico. I love this life. Alban. Que padre o no? <laughs> We're gonna start an eagle scale of coolness and Monte Alban is the first archaeological site that we visited that's going to get five out of five eagles. So that means it's definitely worth coming and checking out. I would say that this is equally as cool as Teotihuacan but in a very different way. The location is what makes this place super rad. It was only 80 pesos per person to get in plus we brought the GoPro so it was an extra 45 pesos so we could record this video basically. Come here for sure. 
We finished the night off getting tostillas quites, a popular street food that adds elote on top of flavored tostitos. Not exactly healthy, but uh, really delicious. You literally said when I said I wanted this and you read the ingredients on the bag that you were not going to touch it. I didn't say I wasn't going to touch it. I just it. looked disgusted you're, you're at it. And half the bag. I'm hungry. After a quick snack, we headed to Los Desantes, one of the best restaurants in Mezcalerias in Oaxaca City, where we had an amazing meal. So as we're packing up to leave today to head to our next destination, we wanted to give you a little tour of this wonderful RV park. They have a communal area that has a kitchen, a pool, TV, like lounge area, and tables to eat. The bathrooms are really nice. Really clean showers with hot water. They also have bikes that you can use to get around town. And I think the best part is that they have recycling. It's our first RV park that has had recycling in all of Mexico. Plus, they have a washing machine in case you want to do laundry. 50 pesos and they hang dry on a line outside. It's pretty awesome. You don't even have to go anywhere. It is properly wired, so it's got grounds and everything, so you're not gonna have hot skin problems. But the breakers are large for the plugs that you're gonna be having to use the plug in. So it's a 15 amp plug, but it has a 30 amp breaker. What that means is you're gonna be able to suck a lot more power than the adapter you're gonna be using with your RV can actually handle. So you will melt either the outlet or the adapter before the breaker will trip. Everything was really nice and grassy with uh, really level spots. And this was the first RV park where we actually had a lot of other RVers. It's a, it's a busy little hub. Yeah, it's a nice little community here and we're right in the city of Santa Maria Tule, which is about a 20 minute drive into the Centro. There's collectivos and buses that come in and out as well as taxis. If you have your own transportation, it's really easy to get into the center. Blazing. Upload speeds and download speeds are out of this world. Best Wi-Fi we've had. It's incredible. Oh yeah. This is the point in our Mexico RV trip where we headed south toward the Yucatan Peninsula. This region, which includes the state of Campeche, Yucatan, and Quintana Roo, has so much amazing biodiversity, charming cities, rich Mayan culture to explore, and amazing food. For the sake of time, and simply because there is so much to do and see here, we've created an entirely separate video showing you what we feel is the best Yucatan Peninsula road trip possible. In total, we spent roughly two months driving this beautiful region before making our way to the state of Chiapas, which for this film is where we're picking you up next. even handle this. I love when I'm doing work outside, listening to howler monkeys growl. Oh, I really hope we see them. You wanna know how we can see them? If we go walk through that like, little freaky jungle pass. I've literally never heard anything that sounds like this before. This is like kind of freaky. Tell you that one now that we're in the forest. Tons of mosquitoes. Well, that was one thing the iOverlander reviews about this place didn't oversell. <laughs> Plenty of time because it's going to take you a lot longer than Google says it's going to take. I've been 
doing 40 miles an hour for the last probably 45 minutes trying to dodge giant potholes and just terribly rough pavement. Chiapas is also one of the poorest states in all of the country, which means that the vigilante tolls are likely on any of the roads here. Many times you'll see groups of people, but especially children, where they kind of create their own blockade or their own personal toll. They use rope to block it off and kind of demand a toll, a payment. It can be as little as 20 pesos. From what we've heard, a lot of people just say that they slowly continue to drive and the kids end up putting the ropes down. So far, we haven't had that experience yet, but from Talking with other travelers who have come this way, it's a common occurrence, so it's definitely something to be aware of. Okay. Well, this is fun. Ticket. Liz didn't have her seatbelt on and we got stopped by another state police checkpoint. No? Okay. No. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Disculpe. Sí, lo sé, lo sé, lo sé. Lo siento. Gracias. He was starting to write the ticket. He checked our licenses and our paperwork and then We're said good. no. That was so nice. He could have easily given us a ticket. It was definitely my fault. But he, he let us off just with a warning. We will heed that warning, senor. Gracias. We're at some Federale checkpoint. I don't know if this is like the entrance to Chiapas, but it feels like a border. Yes, it does. It feels like a straight up country border. Third time today. Gracias. Gracias. All right. Okay. Having these like federale stops throughout your travels in Mexico is quite common. It's always a good idea to have all of your paperwork together. They do want to see all of the originals, so having photocopies for the actual federales or the National Guard won't cut it. to Mayabel campground and villas. This place is gorgeous. It is so picturesque. Dennis calls it Instagrammable, and I have to agree. There are cabanas that you can rent throughout. There's an RV park that actually has electric, water, and dump at each site. And we're about a four minute drive from the entrance of Palenque. So we're surrounded by jungle. When we first got here, we heard howler monkeys again having their little conversation or fight or who knows what they're doing, but it was fun. They also have a restaurant on site. They have uh, wood-fired pizzas. There's Wi-Fi at the restaurant and there's a pool. The electricity is still only 20 amp service, although it is wired correctly. We found a site where we could actually get the van level, but we had to park head first. So that means we're gonna have to turn around before we leave to use the dump or the drenaje. By the end of the day, it's all here. It all works and it's a beautiful place. made it to Palenque. Yesterday it rained all day, which obviously meant we were not able to come into the archaeological zone. And even though it rained pretty much this morning, there was a little break in the rain and we decided to book it. Luckily our hotel and where we're staying at the trailer park is only about a two minute drive to the entrance where you buy the tickets. And there's a ton of guides that are at the first ticket booth. They were charging really, really high rates for a one to two hour tour guide in English or in Spanish. Our suggestion is to continue on on the main road until you get to the actual entrance to the archaeological zone. And if you are looking for a guide, you can hire one there. We ended up hiring one for about a thousand pesos and rates will vary depending on the tour that you're taking as well as the demand. So just keep that in mind if the rates are higher when you come to visit. But we're really excited. This is the third largest archaeological zone for the Mayans. It was a super important city for the Mayan civilization. 
I think it'll have a lot of unique things for us to explore. Super impressive. So the pyramid you see behind me is Templo de las Inscripciones, which means Temple of the Inscriptions. And it has three different walls covered with pictograph uh, inscriptions describing something that the king wanted everyone to know. And next to the temple is the Temple of La Reina Rojo, which is the Red Queen. And they believe that there was actually two queens here that ruled this entire civilization, which is kind of rare. Before the big guy or the big king at Las Templa de Inscripciones actually took power, they found a ton of jade jewelry that was buried with her, as well as a mask that covered her face, and there were some sacrificial bodies next to her grave, which means that she definitely held some significant importance for the civilization, which is why they believe it was either his mom or possibly his grandma since the kings or the queens always kind of followed in a familial lineage. Palenque was discovered just recently after having been abandoned and covered in jungle for centuries. The city was built next to a river that ran through a series of aqueducts and allowed the civilization to grow to its scale and complexity. In the main palace archaeologists discovered underground tunnels, bathrooms, drainage systems, and intricate ceremonial patios. Similar to Kalakmul, Palenque would have actually looked very different during its civilization heyday than it does today. That's because in order to make stucco, which all of the pyramids would have been covered with, you had to use a lot of wood. For example, one ton of stucco would need 10 tons of trees, which means all of the trees that are surrounding us probably would have been cut down. The plaza of the temples is home to three distinct buildings that were used for ceremonial purposes. Archaeologists have discovered several tableaus and murals that give indication for each temple's use, including celebrating and documenting the creation of life, the three levels of life, including the level of the gods and the underworld, and a sundial which helped identify when the spring or summer equinoxes had arrived. No big deal, we're just in the jungle and macaws are flying over ancient pyramids. Absolutely incredible. This is a very impressive archaeological zone. We've been to several throughout all of Mexico now and every single one continues to surprise us. Palenque on the eagle scale of coolness. I'm gonna have to give it five eagles. Seeing the map that they've constructed of the overall site and how many structures are actually here and only 2% of it is actually excavated is mind blowing. Today, we're not taking TLC's advice. We're gonna go chase some waterfalls. RIP Left Eye Lopez. Let's do this. The drive was incredible. Going through the mountains of Chiapas is beautiful. We chose to come to Roberto Barrio Cascada, which is a lesser visited waterfall than the very famous Agua Azul waterfalls, which are about an hour drive as well from Palenque. This place is insane. You just keep going down the paths and then there's more and more waterfalls. We finally got to, I think, the main waterfall. There's beautiful areas to swim. You can climb up on the waterfalls. There's like caves to go in. This place is awesome. Amazing. 
there's something for everyone. You can just chill out in the sun, laying by one of the cool pools when you get too hot. And it was only 30 pesos per person to get here. Can't really speak to Agua Azul, but from all of the reviews, everyone always says, this is definitely the better choice. We plan to come for the whole day. There is a restaurant and bathroom on site, but if you want to bring your own drinks or food, you can do that. We saw lots of people here with coolers planning to bring their own, their little own snacks and lunch. We're gonna hop on the scooter because we still have an hour ride back, right at sunset. And with the number of topes that were randomly on the roads on this trip, we don't wanna be driving at night. Yeah, the tope game on the way into this town is dangerous. Looks like you could camp here. We're like kind of lost. <laughs> so we crossed the river in order to enjoy the beautiful waterfalls. But now we can't figure out how to recross the river to get back to the scooter. We've been at this for a, a solid 20 minutes. There's like not really, there's not really any signs. We don't know. We found it, yay! Yeah. Dennis found it, good job. Good. If it was up to me, I would've, we would've been sleeping in the woods. We had to get one more meal to go. The food at the restaurant here is really affordable, really tasty. I'm pretty sure we ate here the entire five nights we stayed for breakfast and dinner. I think there was one or two nights we didn't. So if you're coming here and you don't want to cook, it's a really good option. morning from San Cristobal de las Casas. Yesterday we embarked on a very long journey from Palenque and I will tell you what it is a gorgeous gorgeous drive but also a very long and tope filled drive. I don't quite understand why Mexico has so many topes throughout the country but yesterday's drive on highway 199 was the most topes we have ever experienced. About every 10 meters, there was a new tope. Some of them were super intense, most of them not marked. So we had to go really, really slow. What was supposed to be a five hour drive ended up being just over seven hours for us. And it was definitely a stressful and tolling drive for Dennis, but we're here. And we arrived to our RV park. It's pretty much the only RV camping that is around uh, San Cristobal de las Casas. But when we arrived, there was a caravan and this entire place was full. They only had one spot for us. We couldn't even plug in our electricity last night because the caravans were using our electricity because there were so many of them packed in here. We couldn't open our door to actually get our hose out to fill water. So we slept with a slide in last night and we're gonna move this morning since the caravan left on their next adventure. There's a lot more options for us, thank heavens. But we're really excited for San Cristobal de las Casas. This is an incredible, Pueblo Mexico. There's no space. Let's move. Okay. We finally made it in the centro. First stop is to get something in our bellies. We worked out this morning. We didn't eat breakfast except for a mango. And we're starving. So we're gonna go to El Caldero and get some local soup. And if you can tell from our outfits, soup is the perfect treat right now because it's actually quite chilly in San Cristobal de las Casas. I think the high for the week is gonna be 75 degrees and the low is in the low 40s. Last night it got down to 44 degrees. So soup is like a nice treat right now. And 
My soup, I got sopa de camarón, came with a beer. It's a special. So yes, please. <laughs> wow. Gracias. No, todo bien? No, approach. Gracias. Gracias. What did you get again? I got the mole de olla. Some sort of beef with squash, corn, carrots, and some other stuff. And I got sopa de camarón, or caldo de camarón, which is a shrimp broth. And it's made with tomato, there's vegetables in here, potatoes. Looks beautiful. Mm, I haven't had soup in so long. It's been so hot, I haven't wanted soup. It's so lovely. It is quite a shock going from the Yucatan for two months to being 7,000 feet in the air. Like, in cold weather. In cold weather. It's very welcome. It was starting to get really hot in the Yucatan Peninsula. Yeah. This is a huge bowl of soup. Highly recommended. to walk off all of that food. I'm not gonna lie, I'm so full. We're gonna walk around a little bit of the historic center. Calle Guadalupe, which we're on right now, is a pedestrian only street. There's tons of cute shops, cafes, restaurants. There's so many people and street vendors selling things. It's a really lively place to be, despite the COVID pandemic. here is a bit indescribable. It's multicultural for sure. There are people from all walks of life here. And even though it's kind of touristy, it still feels very authentic and unique in its own way. It's definitely unlike any other city we've experienced so far in Mexico. But there's tons of different cuisines you can try. There's so many Italian restaurants, Korean restaurants, there's Indian, American food, pizzas all over. So tonight we're gonna to treat ourselves to some tapas. They have really affordable wine, and with each glass of wine, just like in Spain, you actually get a tapa for free. That's my kind of tapa bar. pastries for breakfast. Mm. Buenos dias! It's a new day in San Cristobal de las Casas and the sun is out. The weather is perfect. It literally is like a perfect spring or fall day right now. And we're going on a mission to first get some breakfast, but then try some coffee. Are you kidding me? We already got breakfast. <laughs> Yum! Dennis does not like waking up in the morning and not having coffee. Since that was our mission today was to go get coffee out. We got a grumpy man on our hands. We're finally getting cafe. Dennis will be happy. <laughs> coffee is a big deal here in Chiapas. They are known for having super high quality and an abundant amount of coffee. If you go south close to the Guatemalan border, you will find ton of finca estates, which is where they actually grow the coffee beans. You can stay at these fincas or you can tour them. Unfortunately, we're not going far enough south this trip, but it's definitely something to put on your Chiapas bucket list. But in San Cris, they have a ton of options for trying the delicious coffee of Chiapas. So we ended up coming to Cafe Ologia. Olo I can't say that. <laughs> Cafe Ologia. 
and they actually do a sampling of different types of coffee. So the tasting comes with four different drinks that we actually get to try. Right now we are trying the Flor de Café. So after the leaves or the flowers fall off the tree, they collect them and then they make an infusion from the coffee flowers. Mm. It's just a nice herbal tea. I don't get any coffee notes. Our next infusion is the cascara de café, which is actually the shell of the coffee bean. So when you look at coffee beans, they're like whole and have this kind of hard shell, kind of like a peanut almost looking. And you would get the cascara off of it and it becomes this. This is the semilla, the seed that's inside. And they're green and much smaller than coffee beans you're probably familiar with. That's because once they are roasted, the coffee beans you're much more familiar with, they actually absorb gases and it makes them larger. And of course, when the roasting process brings out that beautiful dark brown color. So this is supposed to be a lot more aromatic with hints of tamarind, possibly haimaka, which is hibiscus. We shall see. Oh. Totally different. Oh wow, it really does taste like Heimoka. Oh, this is lovely. Me gusta esto mucho. It is very different. It's definitely not as soft as the, uh, as the flower. The Heimoka comes in way at the end, mm -hmm. but it's definitely there. Now it's espresso time. It's the smallest little shot of espresso. I can already tell I'm gonna want way more. Mm, my God, it smells so good. Oh my God. Oh. Woo! Woo! Totally different from the first one we had. The first one was so soft compared to this. This is very bold, very intense. It's like you're getting a punch in your mouth, but in a good way, in a delicious espresso coffee way. So our server told us that it was better if we drank it quickly because apparently the oxygen after it's brewed will kill a lot of the properties that's still left in the bean. So. Cheers. And if you're coming to San Cris and you need to shop like us, there's an incredible organic market every Wednesday and Saturday. So they decided to start a market where they were investigating who was selling their food for them. And it started really, really small and over several years it started to get bigger and bigger and now they actually have their own space. A ton of different vendors come. They have eggs, honey, coffee, cheese, meats, prepared foods, uh, gourmet specialties, breads, vegetables and fruits, literally everything you could ever want. We filled up our bag and it came out to less than 200 pesos. What do you do after having a wonderful morning in San Cris? You drink posh. Posh is a local specialty. So we came to La Espirituosa and they are a posh bar where you can do posh tastings. So let's try some posh. The brand that we use is Poshna, which means the house of healing in Sotzil, a language that is used in the communities around San Cristobal de las Casas. Unlike other popular spirits from Mexico, which are made from the agave or maguey plant, posh is made by distilling maize or corn through a process that was brought to Mexico during the Spanish conquest. It is really important to wake up the, the senses, do like a sort of oxygen movement like this. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It is a strong punch. It is strong. Second flavor we have, we're gonna try three. And this is the Jamaica or hibiscus flower. Oh yeah, this is gonna be much up much more up my alley. This is only 18% compared to 45%, so that's kind of telling you something there. Oh yeah, I like this one. This is the chocolate poshna. Chocolate wins, for sure. On Saturday nights, hundreds of red lights dot the streets across the city, an indication that there are tamales for sale. Summer took us to one of her favorite spots to try several new tamales that we enjoyed by the fire back at the campground. So 
Something that is unique to this area in Chiapas and San Cristobal is the amount of native and indigenous peoples that live here. It's home to the most native tribes in all of Mexico. There's so many artisans in agricultural areas that are like the backbone of the state. And as you're walking down the streets, you can just see all of these handmade goods, um, people from these tribes around coming here to sell. And it's a completely different vibe than other states that we visited. We're just gonna spend the rest of the day enjoying the beautiful city, starting with the Iglesia de Guadalupe, which is at one of the top of the hills in the city with gorgeous views overlooking all of the little rooftops and terraces and mountains. It's also a pretty church inside. We're not like the biggest fans of churches, to be honest, but it is very iconic and Instagram shot perfect with the banners right out front of the church. Something else that's special to the state of Chiapas is cacao. We actually toured a cacao farm when we were in the state of Tabasco on our way to Isla Aguada, and it was awesome. We loved getting to see how cacao was grown and processed and how it becomes the delicious chocolate that Dennis and I both truly love. So something we're treating ourselves to today is a cup of fresh hot cocoa. It's kind of gloomy out today and with a little bit of the chill, this is literally like my dream come true for a day. Oh my God, perfect. All of the chocolate that they sell here is made from artisanal cacao farms and everything's organic as well. Now we're at the artisanal market and man, it is a bit overwhelming. It's a bunch of handcraft, really rad jewelry. So many things to see. This place is insane. There are so many shops. Just when you think you have like seen most of it, you turn the corner and it just opens up to so many more stalls and rows. And the thing I think I like the most about this market is that it truly is handmade. You can actually see the vendors and the quality difference. It's hand stitched in most of the stuff and it comes through. It's absolutely beautiful. You can tell which stalls just kind of like purchased and have bulk orders of certain things and you can tell who is really making this stuff. So this is, come plan to spend a, a long time exploring here. It's absolutely beautiful. I want to buy, I want to buy all the things right now. I cannot say enough good things about that market. It was amazing. When you leave the market, you can walk down 20 de Noviembre, which is another pedestrian only street filled with a ton of different shops. So the shopping can continue. The prices have significantly gone up since the original artisanal market. So definitely do your shopping there. One thing that I do want to mention and emphasize as being so amazing here in San Cristobal is how affordable it is. Chiapas is one of the poorest states in all of Mexico and for that reason, prices are really affordable here, but food especially and drinks are out of this world. Your dollar can go a long way in San Cristobal. RV through the centro of San Cristobal because the easy road somebody pulled down some of the low voltage cable wires and we can't get through there was another way out that we could have taken that was that would have taken us to the periferico which is like a ring road around the city but it was a straight up primitive mountain road that we could have never made it up with a like, couple switchbacks, so. Because we're gonna go left here. Jeez. What are you doing? Oh, yeah, and we're bottoming out. Ooh. The centros are always a nightmare. The road quality is awful. They're always either cobblestone or like these concrete tiles. I avoid centros, especially in the RV, at any cost because it's always super stressful. Yesterday we drove an hour from San Cristobal de las Casas to Tuxla Gutierrez, which is actually the capital for Chiapas. And we came here specifically because there is a very famous activity to do, which is going through the Canyon Sumidero. This is the iconic canyon that is actually on the state flag for Chiapas. It is their claim to fame and it's supposed to be breathtaking. 
there's a few things you need to know about buying tickets. You have a cheaper option, which is 270 pesos per person, but you have to wait until the boat has a minimum of 15 people before they will leave. So you could be stuck waiting here for quite some time. I think before we're actually able to leave, we'll be here for about an hour and 15 minutes. Or if you want to take the faster but more expensive route, you can actually hire the entire boat for 4,000 pesos. We're gonna take the cheaper route, 200 US dollars for a two hour excursion is a little too pricey for us. So we're waiting it out. It is helpful to get here around 10. That's when most of the tour groups arrive from San Cristobal de las Casas and it increases your chances of actually being able to get right on a boat and join another group. Hour and a half later, they finally had enough tourists to fill the boat, and we're off. Uh, so apparently, they're gonna stop doing tours at one because there's just a lot of wind. I can tell you right now, it's really rough on this boat. As you can probably see our uh, microphone jumping into the shot because of the wind. And by the way, here's the view from the front. He said he was gonna take really good care of us, and we would have the best experience. I'm not sure we got that. everything is in styrofoam cups and plastic bags is a good time to talk about the amount of trash that's in this river a lot of it 90 plus percent of it doesn't come from the local area whenever the rainy season hits all of it gets washed down from the top of the hills and it ends up in the river and this river is huge fast flowing try not to ever use plastics especially single-use plastics and if you just have to use a plastic make sure you get sure it ends up in a designated landfill Hay dos. There's two crocodiles. You definitely don't want to go swimming in this water. Last night we stayed overnight. Just about a halfway point from going to Chiapas to Oaxaca because it's quite a long drive, about eight hours. But today we woke up early so we could make it to the beach. <laughs> I'm like really excited to go to the beach. This is seriously some of the most windy conditions I have ever driven on. What highway? We're on 185D. Going toward the Oaxaca coast. Yeah. And I will tell you what, there's wind turbines everywhere, which tells you it's obviously a windy area. Yeah, and it makes sense, but we've driven past wind turbines before in other states, but it's never been this windy. Like, this stuff is hardcore. 
it is rocking us over. We're seeing semi trucks that are like tilting, kind of like leaning as they're driving. It's insane. Yeah. So be prepared for a windy drive if you're coming through this way. Yeah. We officially made it. To the coast. Holy moly, it's beautiful. I think we're close to Selena Cruz right now. We're on this twisty little skinny, Aww. dangerous feeling road, but the view of the ocean from here is insane. Oh my god. Wow, dude. directly on the coast and then you have to go at least 10 kilometers in to get to each beach town and this road is a very bumpy uneven dirt road Whew. this is taking way longer than it should yes I just want to mention today's drive day it said it was supposed to take about four hours and 15 minutes according to Google time we are now going on hour six. Woo! Well, we made it. That was a long journey. It ended up taking us about six and a half hours to make it to this particular spot. So if you're coming from the Chiapas path into the Oaxaca coast, make sure to give yourself additional time because you'll need it. But we've made it to our campsite and I will say the hard work and the effort was worth it. I can't wait to show you around tomorrow. But for now, we're gonna call it a night. We're gonna enjoy some beers with our new friends that are staying here as well. And we'll pick you up tomorrow. Buenos dias. Last night we arrived to Don Taco Beach Camping, which we found on iOverlander, and I will tell you what, it was tough to get to, but boy, is this view worth it. We didn't expect this town to be as rural as it is, because when we looked on iOverlander and Google Maps, there was tons of restaurants, a few hotels, so we kind of pictured this being a more developed city on the beach, but it's not. <laughs> That's because on the other side of the National Park, there is a more developed city. It's where lots of people come for vacations. There's a lot of expats living in that community. There's built up hotels and there's actually a cruise port that comes in. Obviously right now there's no cruises, but they're still doing day trips. So people will come from all different parts of the coast and come over here to enjoy a delicious meal, which is why there are so many restaurants. But we weren't prepared at all. We don't have any cash. No. Nope. Don't have any food. No. We don't have any water. No. Luckily, Don Taco has everything we need, and we're gonna go into town and get cash with them uh, one of the days. So we're gonna end up be, we're we're gonna end up being okay. Yeah, we're, we're, this is working out. They have a fruteria in town, which we're going to hopefully stock up on a few more fruits and vegetables. But one thing that is really nice here is that they actually have fresh fish. This morning, I was able to talk to the neighbor's restaurant. We ended up getting a kilo of red snapper for about 200 pesos. That included me tipping them. They filleted it, cleaned it for us. It's like seven huge, beautiful fillets. You know, I, you know we're not necessarily morning people, but here it's not about the sunset, it's all about the sunrises. And since we're going on a big adventure today, it'd be the perfect time to wake up early to watch the sunrise. I got a friend with me this morning. <laughs> I was just drinking my coffee all of a sudden. A dog was here.
today's adventure is going on a three-hour boat tour into the National Park Pactuco. So there's tons of different secluded little beaches that you can actually come to in the National Park, but you can only get there by boat. Franz, the owner of the RV park, helped us coordinate with Alex, who is our tour guide. He has grown up in this village and he's also studying to be a marine biologist. So he's super knowledgeable about the wildlife that you can encounter here. Which there's tons of wildlife here. They get whales, sea tortugas. Right now we're kind of on the shoulder season. So just after March is really the end of whale season and turtle season. But you never know, we might get lucky and see some. We just made it to La Playa India and when we showed up there was actually tortuga tracks from where a turtle had just laid eggs. They come in one direction, after laying their eggs they exit in a different path, which is really cool. So there could be tortugas here as we're snorkeling. I'm ready to put my fins on and do this. So many now. This is like the coolest experience. We saw humpback whales! This is the coolest day of my life. I, I've never seen whales before. And we saw them not just on the water, but like jumping. It's a baby, oh my god! Today was literally like the best day ever. I'm, I'm still in shock that we saw humpback whales jumping out of the water and got to snorkel in beautiful reefs. Hualtuco is absolutely incredible. We're making delicious plantain tacos with a mango, guacamole with cucumber and apple. Oh boy. Show me where the ending goes. Honest, honestly don't. I should be the last to know where all is. This is heaven. Fresh oysters. Delicious food, cerveza, and company. Oh yeah, I could get used to this life. I'm just saying how uh, thankful we are to be able to travel this way and do all of the experiences that we do while we're traveling. I mean, we saw freaking humpback whales today. And now I'm hanging out in a hammock, watching the sun go down. This is unbelievable life. Reluctantly, we're leaving Don Taco. It is really hard to leave here. We've been like dragging out our days, but now even just like our minutes and hours, we're like, well, let's just go for a swim. Let's just work out one more time. Let's just... Checkout's technically at one and we're pushing it per usual. We made it to our next stop on the Oaxaca coast. This is going to be our home base for the next week. The reason we chose Zipolite is because there's an established RV park here. And when we say established, we mean level. There's actually concrete under our parking spot. They have water, electric, and dump at the sites. That's what I'm talking about, baby. 
and the electricity is strong enough to power our AC, so we are living in luxury right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also nice because Zipolite is close to a ton of other beaches that we're going to be exploring a little bit later. Zipolite is known for being one of Mexico's famous nude beaches, so it'll be a unique experience. with naked bodies, I'm gonna say don't come to Zipolite because people are definitely very comfortable. I'd say we're definitely not leaning toward the nudist side of things, so I think one of the other beaches is probably gonna be more of our hangout spot. The good news is there's a lot of other beaches to explore. on the beach there are plenty of hotels and restaurants and bars to choose from if that is of your liking. The sun was just going down, it was absolutely beautiful to watch, but we're getting hungry. And unfortunately it's Tuesday, and I guess that's not a very popular day for restaurants to be open, so we have pretty slim pickings. But luckily, a woman was walking by, and she was selling a freshly made empanadas. This one is sauteed vegetables with curry, which we had no idea what that was. We literally had her say it like 10 times and then I tasted it and was like, curry, it's curry. Okay. <laughs> Very good though. Yeah. Ah. But that's definitely not enough to hold us over for the entire evening. So we're gonna go next door, grab some seafood dinner, and the chances are we're probably picking up tomorrow. One of the best parts about our spot here in Zipolite is that we are really close to a bunch of other beaches and nearby towns, including Porto Angel, which is a really cute little boating and fishing village that has a few beaches to explore, as well as Mazunte, which is a pretty popular destination for travelers in this area. And there's even San Agustinillo, which is a really sleepy little beach town that's supposed to have incredible beaches. So we're gonna head over to Mazunte for the day so that we can kind of see what is going on in the town. talked about before here on the vlog is that here in Mexico on Sundays it's technically family day. It's a big day. All across the country everyone pretty much takes time off. They spend time with their family and most of the time they get pretty drunk. They get wasted. And they get wasted. So a lot of people actually suggest not driving on Sundays just for safety purposes since everyone is out and about and many times people have been drinking but we're not following those rules today we're out and about on a sunday and we're okay with it and we're drinking ourselves but we won't drink later there's plenty of we have several hours before we're going to be driving again but 
We ended up coming to Sensotle, which is actually a burger joint. We're in Mexico, we're going back to the USA soon. We couldn't bring ourselves to get burgers, but a fish sandwich did sound quite lovely. So we ended up getting fish sandwiches for ourselves. We're just enjoying some beers. I'm feeling kind of pretty American right now. Mazunte is definitely touristy. There are lots of people from all walks of life. There's every type of international cuisine you could possibly imagine. And the prices here reflect that, right? They're definitely a little bit higher. But it's a very different vibe from the really touristy areas of like the Riviera Maya. It's definitely much more our speed. There's like Tema's cow places all over. There's like lots of like new moon ceremonies and yoga. And it just definitely feels like it's like a little hippie beach town. I could easily see getting a place here for like a month and just having fun in this little paradise. We made it to the beach. The waves are crazy here. They're huge. And you can feel when you go out into the water, like the current pulling you in all different directions. This definitely isn't like a tranquilo beach to come swim and relax in the water like St. Augustine, but it's still beautiful. It's a small beach here. Since there's so many different mountains kind of jutting across in different spots, it breaks up different small little beach areas. So rather than having like one big long beach to be able to enjoy, there's tons of little small beaches you can choose to go to. And this place is packed. It is Sunday, fun day, right? So that's not surprising by any means. Not gonna lie, it has a little bit of a Tulum vibe. I feel like it's like really hip, trendy, kind of eco-chic in some ways, but not nearly as crowded, not nearly as expensive. So overall, much better. We made our way from Mazunte Beach over to Playa Marmejita. This is the famous beach for watching sunsets in the area because unfortunately from the Mazunte side there's rocks covering where you would actually be able to see the sun set in the west. But if you come over here, it's a completely different experience. A huge long beach with insane waves. There's tons of surfers out here and the sand is even a different color over here. It just feels like a completely different world. And over on the rock behind me, there is a lookout point that is really popular place to watch the sun go down. There's like 40 to 50 people already waiting for the sun to set. But we didn't come here just for the sunset. We specifically came to this beach so we could meet our friends because we are going to go on an adventure tonight to see the bioluminescence. Mazunte in particular in the area of Oaxaca has two lagunas that are extremely famous for having bioluminescence where you actually see the algae and plankton light up in the water. It depends on when you come. Some people say they come and visit and, and they don't really see anything and other people get really lucky. But from our research, everyone said the best chance you have at seeing bioluminescence is when there's a new moon. And last night, by happenstance, it was a new moon. So I, I think the stars are aligning for us to be able to have this really unique and amazing experience here. heading out of Zipolite today, but we're not done with the Oaxaca coast just yet. We're gonna be driving about two hours north of here, just past Puerto Escondido to do something super special. The reason we came here is because it's a turtle sanctuary. They help actually collect eggs all across the beach and patrol it at night. And here you can participate in that. So hopefully, if we got here on time, we'll be able to release some baby turtles to the ocean.
of natural threats, this area of Mexico is particularly dangerous for sea turtles because of the value of their eggs. Despite it being illegal, a number of people still hunt sea turtles to consume or sell their eggs, which made at one point the already endangered species at risk for extinction. But thanks to the efforts of this organization, Vive Mar, and many others along the coast, the sea turtle population is increasing once again. The next morning, the volunteers at Vive Mar showed us how their operation works and what they're doing to protect and improve the sea turtle population. 90 out of 96 eggs in this nest hatched, which is pretty good. But the real work yeah, starts when they get to the ocean. <laughs> Everything we do, you know, is helping them make it to a sea turtle. Eggs to a sea turtle, in there is on their own. From hatching, making it to the water, on that process you got ants, crabs, dogs, raccoons, birds, iguanas, humans, crocodiles, snakes. You, and as soon as they get in the water, any fish bigger than them is already a predator. Right? Here in the coastline, we have thousands of fish looking for food. Man, imagine this little turtle. Man. Yeah, man. The whole life is facing an obstacle to face a bigger one. That's the whole life. Sea turtle. It's estimated that one of every 1,000 sea turtles actually makes it to adulthood. A challenge only made more difficult when combined with hunting. Bibe Mar volunteers patrol the beaches at night, relocating any nest to a protected area where they release the hatchlings with tourists each evening. Many of the volunteers at Vive Mar were once turtle hunters themselves, but through conservation education and creating alternative income opportunities through tourism, they now work and advocate for the protection of these precious animals. Can you believe we could say that we just like released baby turtles into the wild tonight? That was pretty awesome. Seeing them with your own two eyes and like how small they actually are in real life it's just like oh my god oh we were rooting for every single one but oh, don't yeah. worry we waited until all of them got out to the ocean it was like 100 pesos a person to help them release the baby turtles but honestly that's well worth just donating to these guys for the cause it's a very few body team of locals that are heading this operation and they get zero funding from outside sources if they weren't here the turtle population would literally decline rapidly if not completely disappear because of overhunting. So these guys are worth helping out. If you're watching this vlog and thinking, why haven't you guys gone to Puerto Escondido? That's like an awesome Oaxaca coast beach town. And we want to go. We've heard great things. <laughs> We're kind of on a strict schedule now for getting back to the USA. We are just unable to explore in the way that we'd want to. So rather than rushing through it, we decided to spend more time in other places and Puerto Escondido will be a place we have to come back to. Our journey continued to the state of Guerrero, a place we were repeatedly told not to visit due to high crime and cartel activity. We truly believe Mexico is safe to visit and cartel activity very rarely impacts tourists like us. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't be an informed traveler. Acapulco five to 10 years ago really wouldn't have been a place you wanted to visit. It was unsafe, even for tourists. But things have changed, for the better. We spoke with people who were actually traveling here and who had been to Acapulco recently, and they told us it was beautiful and a place worth visiting. Sadly, Category 5 Hurricane Otis absolutely devastated Acapulco in 2023, and it's going to take years for the city to truly recover. While we had issues with corrupt officers here that we'll dive into more later, our opinion about the beauty of Acapulco and its safety remains the same. In true Eat CRV fashion, we're starting our time in Acapulco off with food. Rather than sticking solely to the hotel zone, we wanted to be able to show you a different side. So we came to Taco Mar, which was well recommended on Google. Of course, they specialize in tacos de mar. So we got tons of different types of fish tacos, starting with a marlin and rice. We got a taco a la talla, which is the catch of the day that they typically saute in chipotle or ajo, which is garlic. And then of course, we got a Baja style fish taco. And then I got tacos gobernador, which is shrimp with peppers, onions, sauteed with cheese. And they give you rice and chipotle. That's legit. The sauce is good. Really fish is super fresh. Mm. Just what we needed. Definitely recommend this place. It's not far from the beach, but in town, prices are pretty affordable. The food is really tasty. We 
made it to the beach. Pretty much a 10 minute drive from where we just enjoyed a lovely meal is the beach line. There's tons of huge hotels built up on the beach here. Lots of little restaurants and palapas for you to enjoy a beer under. But something that I'm noticing is crazy about this beach is the amount of people here that are just exercising. Pretty sure there's like a water polo team training right now. There's a soccer team. There were so many people jogging on the Melicone. This is definitely like a fit and healthy city. They, everyone here seems to be doing some type of activity. So this beach, which is right in front of the hotel zone, I think it's Playa Orno, has much calmer waves than, for example, where we're camping. The waves literally crash where we're camping and you can feel the entire RV shake. Like the earth is shaking. So this is definitely a much safer place to enjoy the water here. and the beaches are Acapulco's claim to fame and why most people visit this area, including Las Clavadistas de la Quebrada, which are cliff divers that jump off of that cliff into the water below. They do this like five times a day. They even have night shows where they do it with fire and torches. I have no idea what to expect. I'm just like anxious even looking at the cliff and the waters are so intense. The current, I, I can't imagine diving into that from that height. So we're about to experience the famous show, which I'm really excited for. It was 50 pesos to get into the viewing or mirador area where you can actually watch the show. But if preferred, you can also go next door to the hotel, which is called El Mirador. And honestly, I think the restaurant balcony at the Hotel Mirador is what has the best view. So it's probably the way to go if you're coming. But I'm excited either way. This is gonna be insane. There's so many boats down there like watching as well. That, that might be the best view. <laughs> yeah. The hotel. That looks like the best way to explore Acapulco. I'm like, I would love to be on that boat right now. That was super rad. These dudes are insane without question. Like you have to have a little twinge of insanity, like someone who races motorcycles to be able to do something like this. <laughs> because any rational thinking person would never jump off of a cliff that high. At least I wouldn't. Driving a car, let alone a motorcycle through Acapulco is a little insane. <laughs> the little Mad Maxi in here, the drivers are very aggressive. And because of the way Acapulco is built, being built up on a cliffside that surrounds the Bay of Acapulco, it takes a really long time to get from one side to the other and there's a lot of congestion and traffic and the streets just seem kind of crazy. It's yeah. just a little wild to get around here. The streets are super narrow and the intersections are a little chaotic. But the cool thing is when you're driving, sometimes you end up in little neighborhoods on the cliffside and there are incredible vistas overlooking the beaches and the water here. I see why it's such an appealing place that just grew into this like monster of a city because it's so beautiful. We made a little detour after our lunch stop and we are going to see a famous mural by the painter Diego Rivera. He is one of the most famous Mexican painters as well as his wife. Frida Kahlo. Both of them became very famous here. Diego Rivera is probably one of the most revered Mexican painters. And there is a mural that he did on, on the side of a house. This mural is actually pretty interesting because it's not a painting, it's... A like mosaic. A, it's like a bas-relief mosaic, yeah. It's really beautiful and definitely unique. It seems like it's on a house that's being renovated. Um, so unfortunately a bit of it is covered up, but it's still really cool to see.
a Wednesday, so I can't even imagine what this place would be like if you were coming on a weekend or when tourism's at its peak. But it's so full of life. There's so many people here just enjoying the ocean. Something that we've definitely noticed is there's not a ton of extranjeros or tourists from other countries. It's mostly Mexican nationals here. I'm sure a lot of them live here, but I'm sure a lot of visiting from Mexico City. This is a very popular destination to visit since it's only about a four and a half, five hour drive from Ciudad de Mexico. We're trying to stay away from the hotel zone, which is super built up and touristic. There was a lot of chain restaurants and it just felt like a huge tourist trap. Instead, we've kind of stuck to the old side of town, which to us has been a lot calmer and way more beautiful. And while the public beaches of Acapulco are beautiful, I'm pretty sure we have the best spot possible. Just outside of town, about a 25 minute drive from the main centro of Acapulco is our campground, which is the Acapulco RV Park. It's full service, meaning we have electricity, dump, and water on site. They have beachfront spots and they have spots tucked between palm trees that are equally beautiful. And we are on a completely secluded beach. over. Maybe you need a front plate and that's why he stopped us. Yeah. Let's go. Yes, yes, yeah. I guess that's why we got stopped. Yeah. Some states in Mexico require uh, a front plate and a back plate and some states don't. Apparently Guerrero is one of the states that require both and we didn't have a front plate so, so they flagged us. Stopped. Yeah. But once we showed him and told him where we were from and our paperwork, yeah. let's go. Yeah. Seemed a little sketch at first because we didn't do think anything, we'd do wrong. anything wrong. We were like, what the hell? We're turning on a camera. This is. But this is the thing. If you know, if you know you haven't done anything wrong, then there's no reason to be annoyed or afraid. And as long as you know you provide what they need, usually you're good to go. Unless get a bad apple, but I feel like that's very few and far between. Oof. Hola. Español. Un poco. Como así. ¿Por qué? Aquí no puedes bajar vehículos pesados. Okay. De tres y media en adelante ya no pueden bajar. Ah, okay. Aquí arriba hay anuncios. Yeah, no, no hemos visto. Where your license? Google dicen va aquí. Pero señalamientos no dice Google. Y hay que pagarlo el día de mañana. Pagaría. No, vamos a México. Necesito ir a México hoy. Pagarían 7,800 por ahí. No, ok, vamos a la estación y podemos pagar ahí. Sí, tú puedes ir hoy, pero no va a estar tu documento hasta el día de mañana. No, porque necesitamos ir a México hoy. Vamos a México porque necesitamos ir a la frontera de Estados Unidos. Pero ahorita, ¿a dónde vas? México. ¿Pero vas mal? Pero no, no, no sé. ¿Ya okay. pagarías tus 7,000 allá? Y... Ya te, de, te liberan tu documento. Siete mil. Sí. Bueno, Siete mil. Siete mil pesos. Increíble. ¿La estación y no, no, no tenemos este pesos. Because we have no idea where we're driving and we're just following Google's instructions. We're on a road supposedly that we are too much weight for. And he was trying to say that in order for us to pay, they keep our license overnight and we come back and get it. No. Absolutely not. No. 
Este es nuestra 21 estado y no tenemos este problema en otras ciudades. Arreglamos tu infracción aquí. ¿Cuánto quieres pagar? Aquí te vas. He's saying, if you pay me here, I'll let you go. So we got it. I don't know. I want to go. It really is such a crummy system built on putting pressure to give you no other option but just to pay them. And it just perpetuates this problem. I can guarantee you if we would have went to the station, that wouldn't have been 5,000 pesos. If we didn't have to be in Mexico today, we would have uh, yeah, we would have taken that to the station. Yep, it stops. Oh my God. This is insane. Oh my God. We're never gonna get there, dude. Eres la tercero policía a intentar a hacer una infracción hoy, en una hora. Y no entendemos porque todo dicen, ok, después de esto estás bien. Ok, so sabemos esto ahora. Por favor, podemos ir. Carril de la cabul. Well, that was a much nicer experience. Exactly what the sh first guy should have done. He, the first guy totally robbed us, knew he was robbing us. And the first mistake we made was giving him our actual license. Yeah. He knew that the second that we did that, yeah. that's where we messed that's up. That's where we messed up. And we even we've advised you not to do that. We even have photocopies so that if this exact thing happened, they don't have our actual license to hold it against us. As long as you show them your official license, don't give it to them, show it to them, and then give them the copy, that should be sufficient. We're never giving anyone but a National Guard or a Federale our license immediately ever again. And if you were driving in Acapulco coming on the Rapido Road, you can drive here. It's the easiest way to get to Acapulco and it's probably how you're going to be getting here. So it's inevitable. You just need to stay on the side. Do not go down the center roads. So there's side roads that look like they go through the town. As annoying as it is, that's the road you need to be on. Yep, and if you see a bridge coming up, immediately get all the way over to the right and do not drive over the bridge because that's where the three and a half ton infractions come into play. The third cop did explain to us that the maximum infraction that you can get is a 5,000 peso infraction. But he said if you're a foreigner and obviously you're not from here and you probably don't know the laws, they will actually charge you a lesser amount, which is the minimum, which is probably going to be around 3,600 pesos. So technically we still paid far less than we would have if we had gone to the station. But, but it that's just... the kind of behavior we don't want to condone. Exactly. Because now that guy is going to just continue to do that thing because he thinks people yeah. like us don't know. Yeah. Learn from our mistakes here. I can't believe we got taken. And when things are really tough and they're really rough and nothing's working, but there's something inside of you that says, I just have to follow that. Because you don't know who you're gonna be, who you're gonna be, who you're gonna be. Okay. We're ready to go. We're getting an extra early start today because what happened to us yesterday, we don't want to happen again. So even if there's delays, like the three cop stops we had coming out of Acapulco yesterday, we should still make it to our destination by dark. We overnighted in some random town. The RV park's actually kind of nice. It was quiet, so that was welcome. But uh, today, we're gonna push all the way through past Mexico City to San Miguel de Allende. Whoa. Today has been an even worse drive day. God. Very pretty cool. Yeah. See, do not drive through Mexico City 
even on the bed of Federico, it is absolutely insane. And technically, you're not supposed to be a camion on the Pedifetico, so we ended up taking the side roads. And the side roads are extremely hard to navigate. There's all different ways that you can go, and if you make one wrong turn, you're now on the wrong highway, which you're not allowed to be on. So we got stopped by the police. He understood we were lost, and he told us how to make a U-turn to go back to the Pedifetico. But now, we got stopped again, and they are trying to get money from us. They won't let us go unless we pay a huge fine and now they're trying to talk it down, just like the other cop did. The Pedifetico side road has already added like two hours to our drive. It's absolutely insane. And of course, we ended up having to go to the city and on certain days of the week, you're not allowed to drive as a foreign plated license plate in Mexico. But that's in the city. We knew that, but the only way to make a U-turn to get off the road we weren't allowed on was to go through the city. Of course, literally the one road we had to do a U-turn on, we got pulled over. I understand. So we just keep going straight, or what's yes. the deal now? So look, keep going straight. Then we get to the Pedifetico, and we are getting on the Pedifetico. The point of this, of the lesson here today, is to avoid driving around Mexico City at all costs. Even if there's other routes that take way longer, take it. Because it's not worth the headache, the stress, the complications, the confusion. Well, we made it. We left at 9.30 a.m. and we just arrived at 5.30, meaning it took us eight hours for what was supposed to be a five-hour drive. Fortunately, I didn't actually end up giving any money to the cop today, but we're here. We're in San Miguel. And the good news is we have a lot of fun stuff planned. We visited San Miguel on our way out of the country, our first trip through Mexico. We absolutely loved the historic center. It is just beautiful. There's so many great restaurants here. So check that out if you haven't watched it. This trip, we are going to be doing completely new activities because there really is a lot to do and see here. And our friends Greg and Karen are meeting us here to exit the country with us as they make their way back to Canada. <music> coming here and you're into wine, you are definitely in for a treat. We're going to be doing kind of a luxurious little getaway for the next few days. The Valle de Guadalupe, which is in Baja, is really known for their wines here in Mexico. But San Miguel de Allende, going all the way to Querétaro, is also really popular for vineyards and wineries. Unfortunately, when we first passed through here, everything was closed due to COVID. But it's open now. So we were able to actually hire a driver today. He coordinated everything, including all of our reservations for vineyards today. We're going to two wineries where we're gonna be doing tastings and we're also gonna be getting lunch. I am so excited to be here. Our first stop is Tres Raices, which means three roots. Let's drink some wine. It's lovely. Definitely lean more toward the red wines, but this is really lovely. It has a nice buttery feel to it. It's very clean and crisp. Ooh, I could drink that on a hot day like today. Tres Raices has only been open for five years like growing from the vines. And all of these wines have been absolutely incredible. It's kind of mind blowing that it's such a young vineyard and they're producing such high quality wines. The ambiance here is beautiful. You have gorgeous vistas. The wine is great. We're not trying any food today. We're gonna to be getting lunch at our next stop. Our 
second stop is La Santisma Trinidad and this property is incredible. It feels like we've been transported to Tuscany, Italy. No joke, the restaurant, the homes here, absolutely breathtaking. Unfortunately, the group here that we thought we were joining for our wine tasting was like huge. There was at least 20 people sitting at the table. We thought it was gonna be more of a private tasting, so we decided instead of doing a tasting ourselves, we'll just go to lunch and enjoy and try all the wines at lunch anyways. They also make olive oils here, they have marmalades, they have bug spray, they dry lavender to make different tinctures. It's absolutely incredible. of dozens that you can visit. Definitely make appointments. I suggest hiring someone to possibly drive you because obviously you don't want to drink and drive. We will have a, a link to the information for the guide that we used to take us out today if you're interested in hiring him for a day trip. But definitely make sure you have reservations. Super, super amazing day. Day two of luxurious experiences here in San Miguel de Allende is off to an amazing start. We find ourselves at the Mayan Baths, which is like a luxurious spa getaway that has thermal baths inside a cave system and then outside with these gorgeous infinity pools overlooking the beautiful mountains of San Miguel de Allende. If you come here, you can choose to just soak for the day. They have lunch and drinks. They'll actually bring you drinks in the pools. You can get massages here. They have all different types of massage choices. It's literally what luxury dreams are made of and I couldn't be happier. soaking time you get a luxurious towel and it has a number on it so you don't get it confused with other people which I think is really awesome. They give you a towel, they have this whole area for changing, showers, bathrooms. Level 10, amazing. Like I don't want to be leaving right now even though it's only a 10 minute drive back to the RV park. This is the heaven. I just want to stay here forever. Chilaquiles Verdes, and this guy enchiladas con mole. Since our time here is almost done, we're just trying to eat all of the Mexican food possible. San Miguel is actually a very international city. You can find pretty much every cuisine you can imagine or want, and really good versions of it. All right, let's get the heck out of here, man. Matahuala, here we come. It's supposed to be like a five hour drive. Crossing my fingers real hard. Ready for today? Yo, yeah. And just like that, we're out of here. We ended up just staying one night at Las Palmas Inn. It's a hotel that is in the city of Matehuala. We've stayed here now three times. It's our third time. And it's just such a comforting place for us after having traveled to and from Mexico, coming from Texas, 
when we stay at Las Palmas Inn, it's like we've made it. <laughs> Either we're making it back to the border shortly or we've just crossed the border into Mexico and either way, it feels really good. We woke up super early this morning before the sun was even up so that we could hit the road and make it to the Columbia border crossing at a reasonable hour. So we have about a seven hour journey ahead of us. Here's to a smooth day. since you're not allowed to take any frozen meats or uh, raw meat, as well as fresh vegetables, just cook it. major benefits to crossing at Columbia. It's wide open, a lot more space, less traffic, which means for an RV you don't have to deal with as much craziness. But there's also the Bon Hercito and everything that you would need in one location. It's really important before you cross the border that you return your TIP, which is your temporary import permit. If you have a tow vehicle, you should, such as a motorcycle like us, you would need to return that. You'll get your deposit back. And for your vehicle, like your RV or your trailer, it would be for 10 years. But if you don't plan to come back with that specific RV, 
you plan to change your RV in the future, you wanna make sure that you remove and cancel both tips. Always so intimidating. America is intimidating. Yes, it is. <laughs> Border crossings are always intimidating. We are citizens of the United States, and we still get nervous for no reason. There's no, for no, there's reason. no reason for us to be nervous. How's it going? Good, man. Good, how are you? Good, good. We've been We're, traveling, traveling for. We went on vacation for almost six months. Yeah, we just stayed Matawa last night to get here. Anything on the care coming back? Any fruit, plants, meats, vegetables, alcohol? Nothing? No. no food, nothing? No, we cooked it all. <laughs> Ate it all, eggs. cooked it all. Thank you. Cool. We're through. That was easy. Oh my god, that was so much easier than our last one. They didn't even come on board. Oh my god, we're, we're, back, we're back in the U.S. Welcome home. <laughs> wow. The Texas Travel Welcome Center. We left at 7.05 this morning. We arrived at the border crossing at 3.05. So it ended up taking us about eight and a half hours for the entire border crossing and drive. Yes! Sakate! You come bearing gifts! I love you! <laughs> Guess where you're at? Ooh, it's gonna be a bit loud tonight, eh? Uh, yeah. Cheers. Cheers.